Father God, as we come before you and we come to the word portion of your worship, may we worship in word and truth today, Lord, as we receive your word to instruct us, remind us, to refresh our memories, to maybe teach us a new thing, to maybe convict us of the thing we've done or have done or are going to do for up teen years and maybe our temperaments, that this truth confronts that and says, no, listen to the truth of the word of God because God is true. And these things we ask by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and through your grace, and by the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. An old hymn, an old song, an old scripture. Are old things no longer as valuable, or do they become more valuable? It depends. Some things we look at, we will keep for nostalgia's sake. Some of us keep things in our houses because we can't live without them or see ourselves without them. But I wonder if the scripture still has a valuable place in your life. I wonder as we go forward this year, is the word of God treasured in your life? It isn't so much the past that we concern ourselves about as much as we learn from that and today we arrive at a point of saying, today I will choose. Today I'll put the word first. Today I will listen to what God is saying. Today I will follow him. Today I want to read Psalms 23. As we looked at Psalms 23 briefly for the scripture reading, there's a structure to it. You have to pay attention to the beginning because the middle is crucial to the ending. Did you get that? You have to pay attention to Psalms 23 because the beginning is crucial to the middle so the ending makes sense, all right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as you stop there and pause a minute, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you have needs? Two, three people have needs. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, you all do. Do you have wants? I don't know. Am I allowed to have wants? <laughs> you have wants. But it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not be in lack of anything I need. I shall have all that I need. And you're going to see why that's important because in the, in the last part of Psalms 23, it's going to show you how God does things. It's not just where he says, okay, minimum requirements. I've satisfied my obligation to you as God. I've given you exactly what you need. You wanted food? I gave you three Cheerios. There, I'm done. I've given you shoes. I've given you exactly two pairs. And that's all you need. Done. <laughs> Health, you're at 75% well most of the year, so I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> when you look at God as God and treat Him as God, then you recognize your needs have been met. You shall not be in lack. My father grew up in Peru, and he grew up as, I didn't grow up this way, because my father made a promise and determination that his family, his sons, his children would never grow up the way he did. I never lacked anything. He made it his personal uh, mission almost to make sure that what we had was better than what he had. He brought us to Peru uh, when we were in third grade, when I was in third grade, for three weeks. We visited all the places, Lima, where my grandmother and aunts lived. We, we went to the highest navigable lake in, in the world, Lake Titicaca. We went to the Cusco, the old capital of Inca, where the stone is like the size of this room, perfectly cut, and it sits on the top of a mountain. He showed us the wonders, and then he showed us the city, and he showed us, he says, this is how I lived. I, I, I don't know, maybe I can find the house, and this is how I did things. And he says, you know, and he drilled this into my head when I was younger, and I didn't understand until I went to Peru. We always had food on the table, not very much. And with uh, seven or eight brothers and sisters, not very much, but we always had something to eat. Now, how much, you, you don't conceptualize the fact that he always had something to eat, though not much, and maybe not the tastiest. He didn't reveal later that the rule at our house was you will eat everything your mother cooks for you. And you did. I don't care if you liked it or not. It wasn't an option. Oh, I don't, it's not an option. <laughs> he had to eat everything. And then I got older. I cooked for him, and he, he took his fork, and he removed the tomatoes. I said, what are you doing? Because what? You taught me what? He says, number one, you're not your mother. <laughs> And secondly, I don't like tomatoes. I've never had that option. I know you didn't. 
I do. <laughs> it is a luxury that he could pick out tomatoes now. It wasn't an option back then. We have so much that we think in our minds, I can pick and choose what I want. And, what, and in fact, we rationalize. What I want becomes what I need, and what I need becomes what I want. And pretty soon, I become my own dictation of what is right and wrong. I determine that what I need, and I will tell you, I will offset your reasoning. I will tell God to his face, yes, that what I need is actually more important. In fact, I will justify myself in doing what I want because I think I need it. Amen? How many relationships are built upon need or want? How many young people go through the world and suffer the issue of saying, wait a minute, I have everything I need at home, but I know what I want. How many arguments and separations in families have been based on the fact of what I want has been more important than what I need. God shall supply all your needs. Amen? I didn't make that up. God said so. So you know what the really awesome part of faith is? You can hold God at his word. God can make a promise. He will not break it. If God says, I'll supply all your need, you can pray and you pray. God, you promise to take care of all my needs. I'm not telling you what to do, God. I'm reminding myself, you already said it, and I'm claiming that in faith that you will do that in my life. Brothers and sisters, how often we take our eyes off the instructor. How often do we take it because we look at what fears and what scares us. We look at the things that we think are bigger than life. We look at our families and our problems. Some of our problems start when we're 20 and they don't leave us. We just keep making or having more problems and they seem to get uh, bigger and bigger problems in our area, our living. There's no escaping. You will always have needs and you will always have want. But God says, as long as I'm your shepherd, you shall have need of nothing. And if you trust me, you shall want neither more than I give you. Verse 2. He makes me to lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And although you can look at this and reflect on the fact of how a shepherd is writing this psalms from the knowledge and the wisdom of a shepherd, the fact that sheep don't go into a raging water and drink. The fact is you have to make a pool and still. And the fact that God will quiet your life so that you can restore your soul. Amen? There is here an, a symbol, but a metaphor, but a promise. When your life is tumultuous, scary, when the water that you're saying, I need a drink, but I can't get a drink. I won't be able to. The water's too much for me. The very thing that I need, which is thirst, I'm overwhelmed by the resource. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt lonely? And to feel lonely, says, I'm overwhelmed by the thing I need, but what is going to solve it is too much for me. Brothers and sisters, it says that if you trust God, He will make the water still, so you can be satisfied, and you will be restored. In verse 3, He restores my soul. He leads me to the path of righteousness for His name's sake. The very fact that He is leading you, isn't some make-believe, isn't some map, isn't... Sometimes I wonder if we pray this prayer. God, I will do all that you ask me to do today as long as I know you're in charge. Or do we say, God, I acknowledge you as God, but the rest of the day is mine. You take the key out of the ignition because you're in charge. Did your car go anywhere? He leads me in the paths of righteousness. When you look back, you'll be able to see the right things that were done in your life, not because you can brag about it, because God did them. Sometimes, are there any stubborn people in this room? One, two, three, four, okay, yeah, a little bit. Confession. <laughs> Those of you who are not stubborn, let me ask you a different question. Have you ever resisted change? Have you ever resisted someone telling you what to do? What if God is speaking to you? And that temperament you have of saying, well, I'm a big boy, or I'm stubborn, or I'm patient, or I have a, you know, whatever your ailment is, <laughs> is it an excuse not to do what God asks you to do? If God says, I will supply all your needs, if God says, I want to be your shepherd, if God says, I will still the waters, I will give you what you want. You want, the, I mean, for a sheep, it's not like I want brown grass. The, the optimal food for the sheep is green grass, not like uh, gourmet grass. Not sugar-coated grass. Grass. What do you think God knows that you need? Is it really that simple and basic? 
Have we been, do we need to be weaned off maybe the world's food that makes it like, uh, makes you, how should I say this? Um, you, you crave that which is not good for you and you don't want that which is, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. I want you to think about it for here. So as we come to trust God in the beginning of the Psalms, we begin this relationship where He is my shepherd. He takes care of me. Therefore, if He takes care of me, I can trust Him. And if I can trust Him, now look what's happening. I'm in the valley. I'm not on the mountaintop. I can't see a huge horizon around me. I can't see where the light, where the sun rises and sets on the top of the mountain. I'm in the shadows of the valley. I'm in a, a, almost a cleft. I'm not in a great place for defense. I'm not well protected. Can I still trust you, God, in the valley of the shadow of death? That is, maybe there's a valley in your life that is so empty or void of good things or life that you say, that's it. I have to do it my way. Because obviously, I'm in the valley of my life, in the shadows of my life, and the part that feels like death. So therefore, because God doesn't know what he's doing, I will take back my life and I will do it my way. And if you've never done that before, I think it's time today we become honest with ourselves because you have. It is a constant human struggle to follow God. We don't do it naturally. We don't want to. We think we don't need to. And the good news is, young people here, if you're younger than 105, young people here, is that today you can ask God to be your shepherd again. Today, if you haven't gone through a valley experience, you will. It's a guaranteed part of our existence here. Bill, whether it's sickness or lack, you will go through that valley experience. If you haven't as a child, with your family, with your parents, with your work, with your coworkers, with your own kids, you will have that point in your life where it is dark and the shadows are covering you. There is no light. There is no hope. It seems bad and you think it's up to you. And in fact, as the wind whistles around your life and you think it's devoid of God, where is God? You almost look at Him and some of you might be actually tempted to hold your fist up at Him because why weren't you there, God, when? And you can fill in the blanks for your whole life. And here God says, I was with you. And you say, but that wasn't good enough. I want all the pain out of my life. I want all the good things in my life. And God says, did you not hear? I'll take care of all your needs. I'll, take, I'll be there for you because I want, remember the trust, right? We're in the valley. It doesn't seem like he's around. I can't hear him. I, I may not be able to see him. He, he, maybe he's too far ahead of me. Maybe he's, maybe he's around. Maybe I think he's, he's gone from me and I'm lost. Have you ever felt lost from God? Ever felt so distant and you forget to trust the truth of the faith of the Word of God because you're feeling that He's not near? How many years has it been that you rushed out the door without giving God equal time in your life or a bigger portion of your life and you walked out after 20, 30, 50, or maybe five years and you wake up one day and realize, where is the shepherd? I remember my mom, my grandmother. I remember church. I remember some lady. I remember someone praying. I remember these things. But today I'm asking you, make them true in your life. The good news is the book that God's writing in your life is always being written today. You look at your past and where you came from. That's just an indication of what happened. What do you want to do with the, the future? I look at this because I know with me in my first district, uh, I think I've shared this with one or two people, I don't know as much as I was um, naive and I really wanted um, to be a good pastor. And uh, the boss, the person in charge told me what to do. He told me four things to do. And um, when I stopped doing those four things, I realized that I had to feel where God was leading me rather than just being the second person there to the... But then I thought, doesn't everyone pray or, you know, have moments? And then I, I remember something God taught me in college. Um, Dr. Derek Morris, one of my professors in college, says, I want you guys to graph your spiritual journey. Oh, okay, this is great. Oh, this is exciting. Okay. All right, start here where you can remember your journey with God and go. And I said, oh, okay. And pretty soon I didn't have paper on the top because I'd started so high. I'm like, I'm going places. <laughs> I'm going. I'm on the mountaintop. And I realized that pretty much that portion of my life is basically at the mountaintop because it kept going up, right? I look around. I see people like this. 
and they graph up. And, and then I see a lot of people down here. So pretty soon I'm like, and so I stopped going up. I thought maybe I'm supposed to be plateauing. Maybe I should, maybe I'm in my valley, I don't know it. So pretty soon from, oh, and I didn't want to, then I kind of like closed my paper and, you know, I thought, did you ever look at other Christians and think maybe you're the one that has the problem? <laughs> I thought I had a great relationship with God. It was growing. I was praying. I was listening. He was talking to me. Have you ever said, pray so God talks to you? He didn't make that up. We read words because at some point we need to learn what God is like and we need to know how he talks. But at some point God says, hey you, and you're like, me God, you want to talk to me? And that was my experience, it was great. And I look around and said, maybe I'm wrong. And at that moment I entered my valley. Because <laughs> so, I doubted maybe everything was wrong because all these other Christians were like, oh, little up, little down, little up, and like a sinoid rib. I said, wow, my life is supposed to be like what? Ups and downs, valleys and... I said, oh, I didn't know that. Why? Because for whatever reason, God had blessed me. I was just climbing. You know, Sound of Music, anyone? Yeah. All right, Julie Andrews on the opening scene of the mountain, right? I was like living the dream. <laughs> and everyone says, How is your, how's life? I said, like, life is great because God had blessed me and I was on top of the world. Later as I got older, I realized that life isn't so nice, but God is awesome. But the two were together at that moment. So what is wrong with everyone? God is good. Life is great. Yeah. Let's get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and we'll sing. Come on, let's pray. And it was like, too much. <laughs> and I've realized since then that having the mountaintop experience is almost easy. Having your faith in the valley is the test. God can show up at any time in your life and bless you. He can bless you with children. He can bless you with good things. He can bless you with knowledge. He can bless you with a revelation of his word in your life. You say, wow. But then you have the valley experience where now the good times seem to stop. And now I don't know if I'm interested in God because why? It's not fun anymore. It's not singing and newly Andrew's experience is now gone and now you're with nobody knows. The troubles I've seen, nobody knows but thank you. If no one knows that song, see me afterwards. <laughs> we'll have a little sing, sing fest here. On verse 5 it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of who? My enemies. In the fact of those who threaten me, the fact of those things that are against me, the things that are out to destroy my life or where I'm at today, those very things you're setting up a table where I can eat. I don't know any other time in history where you have two armies stacked on each side and usually they, they give the um, negotiations before or during the battles. Ever the battle line is drawn up. No one says, and then suddenly someone put a table in the middle of the battlefield and started eating. Hey guys, no worries here. I know we're going to go to battle, but I'm going to eat. No. The fact of the matter is, God's saying, in the fact, you can, your enemies can be around you, and you can be at peace enough to enjoy your meal. That's unheard of. That you can eat in perfect peace, because I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. In fact, what I'm going to do is this. Remember the beginning? Now we're coming to the end. I will anoint your head with oil. Your cup will run over. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. But then you're telling me my cup will run over. Can the two happen at the same time? Brothers and sisters, this is the good news. He'll supply your needs, but the blessing in supplying your needs will overflow. That's the good news. We think, well, God will give me my bread and my water. Well, if that's what a Christian's going to be, let's do it. <laughs> Let him sign me up. Let's evangelize the world. Bread and water Christians, unite. <laughs> Let's, what can you do with bread and water? Make soft bread? I don't know. Make soup bread? What? That's the kind of God we preach sometimes. It's a stoic, you know, starchy God. You know, this is good for me. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and God says, I will not only take care of your needs, but I'm going to bless you so that your cup, that is, you won't be able to receive my blessings. So if we trust God, he'll take care of our needs, but from the overflow, think about this. He's not going to just give you a piece of bread. He's going to give you a loaf. My cup overflows. If I look back at how God has taken care of me, 
He has really blessed me. Surely goodness. What kind of goodness are we looking for, people? When God says, I will anoint your head, I will take care of your wounds. I will soothe your irritations. I will take care of those things that hurt. I'm going to take care of you. Brothers and sisters, some of you may have wounds from your childhood, even from your marriages, from your relationships in the past. And how you're dealing with that is the best way you can. You try to get band-aids and you fix them or you just roll back into the same problems. Like, didn't you just go into the thicket? Yeah, I know, but that's the only way I know how to go through. So you go back in the thicket. Everyone looks around and you say, what are you doing? That's all I know to do. And you say, but there's another way. God is over here leading you away from the pain and problems. You keep going into the thicket. And he keeps having to get you out. And you say, yeah, but I, I don't want to hear what God has to say. I know, I'm doing, I'm no, I, I know it's not right. I know that I'm doing is not right. And he's like, that's not God. God's saying, I'm trying to help and heal you. Amen? Wouldn't it be awesome if the world says, where do you want to go for healing? Where do you want to go for someone to help you out? <gasps> you need to go to church. Is that your first, re what's your first response? When you're hurting, do you say, oh, I'll go to church, right? When you're hurting, do you say, I'll just pray to God, right? What's the knee-jerk reaction when you're hurting? What do you do? You cover your owie and you kind of close up a little bit to protect it, right? Do any of you cry? Come on, grown men. When you get sick, do you whine? Let's hear it. Come on. Can you, can you just put the cover? Can you just put the Can you just... Did you? But when mommy's sick, the whole house is upside down. Well, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> My cup overflows because I have a good wife, amen? And I have a good mother. But you don't realize the goodness until you're out. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me in all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Take Psalms 23 together, the whole thing. Don't just memorize it. Say it. Realize that you begin a relationship with God, the Lord, as your shepherd. You accept him and say, Lord, I want you as my shepherd, so I will never want. I will be satisfied with you. I know that you'll... Give me what I need. And it's not going to be just standard brown or bread. It's going to be green pastures. You're going to give me the best thing that I need. It's going to be the best thing for my life. You're going to come through, Lord, and you're going to do what? You're going to restore my soul. The times when I'm weary, I'm tired, I can't do anymore. You're going to give me that time. You're going to refresh my soul. I have to trust you. When things look problematic, you're going to come through. You're going to restore my soul. You're going to lead me not just whimsical ways. You're going to lead me in paths of righteousness. So when I look past, over my shoulder, I will say, God led me, and this is the way he led me. He led me to you. He led me here. He led me to the word. He led me to the truth. This is the good news. When you witness of Jesus Christ, it's not so much, you don't witness the black stuff. I, when people give testimonies, let me slow the train down a little bit. Don't tell them all the black stuff. Don't say, and then chapter 3 was really bad when... I don't need to see that. There's a reason why I don't watch that. <laughs> what you're telling people is what God did in your life and what he's doing. They, don't, they already know the black stuff. Everyone has here has dark stuff in their past. Don't, I know that. Tell me what God did for you. Tell me how he rescued you. Tell me how he saved you. Tell me how he met your needs. Brothers and sisters, when you look back over your life, you can say God's the best choice. Why? Because he led me all the way. Because my footsteps have been guided. Because the righteousness that God has isn't, in my mindset, whimsical. It's the fact that it's according to his right doing. God led me on the right way. Finally, when you get through that valley experience, and you go through the shadows of the valley of death, and you fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Now, you may not feel it, you may not believe it, but if someone has to tell you, if someone has to call you, someone has to pray with you, you need to remember God has never left you. But, but I'm doing what's wrong. I know, you know, maybe even the world knows you're doing what's wrong. And maybe it's a little bit of hypocrisy. The point is, God knows He's with you. He didn't say, oh, you're in the valley of shadow of death, you're in the weakest point of your life, you're, you, you, you are in the valley, I'm going to leave you there. I'm going, to, I'm going to forsake you there in the valley. Because, does, my, does your Bible say that? My Bible doesn't say that. There's not even a footnote saying, if you do really bad things, I, I, you're out of here. I'm done with you. Does, does your Bible, how many of you guys still open your Bible? You're just looking at me. <laughs> Verse, it doesn't say that, does it? I said, I will fear no evil, for you are... Well, pastor, if I do the right thing, I'm going to suffer these problems. Brothers and sisters, if you don't do the right thing, you're already in the valley. Amen? So what are we looking for here? 
You prepare a table before the presence of my enemies. At some point, if you're going to have opposition or conflict, and you're going to say, well, this is what I need to do, or if someone says, well, this is what you need to do, ask them, did you pray about that? I like asking young people this when they say, oh, I'm in love. I said, okay, that's fine. Did you pray about it? Uh, well, uh, and there's this, their whole like structure changes, their whole facial change. Why? In your present life right now is the results of your life right now. I need everyone to, this is a pop quiz. Ready for this? You've studied for this all during the sermon and you're not falling asleep yet. Is your present condition of your life because you prayed for it or you got what you deserve? How come no smiles? I don't get what's going on. Uh, I don't know if I want to answer. Is your present life, look back over your history, quick, flash, Maybe some of your hard drives are not as uh, big as some of ours. <laughs> is where your present condition in life because you prayed or because you just landed there by accident and just, it was all, you know, Frank Sinatra, what was one of the favorite songs he sang? I did it. Now how come you guys knew that song? You knew that answer, right? <laughs> the man of cool, the man of style, right? We all know that. But when God says, I will take care of you. So let me tell you the good news, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter where you came from. It matters right now that you're talking to God and saying, God, I'm giving you my mess. Because at the end of my life, I want to say, I didn't do it my way. God did it his way in my life. There will never be a braggart in heaven. There will never be a perfect person in heaven that says, I did everything myself. I did, I did God a favor by being in heaven. <laughs> I am just so good that people are just blessed have me in their own sphere of influence. I, I mean, I am just that good. <laughs> Maybe you have someone like that. You need to pray for them. Just smile and pray as you walk past them. <laughs> Those people don't need God because they're trying so hard to make their lives perfect and clean. Brothers and sisters, if we can make our lives clean, would we need a cross or a Savior or Jesus? Would he need to shed his blood for you? The very fact is you need Jesus Christ right now at the beginning of your year. I guarantee you at the end of the year, should he not come at the end of the year, you'll be able to look back and say, for his righteous name's sake, he led me all the way. So right now, take all your problems that you have, take all your concerns, take all your hypocrisies, whatever the junk you have, take all your problems, and I want you to put them in a big basket or ball, right? Mine's a sticky, nasty ball. What color is yours? Do you have the color, or is it just... Take all those things, and I want you right now to say, God, I'm giving them to you, because this is my life. Step back and say, now I want you to shepherd me. I need you to fix it. How many of you guys want to let God fix your life? How many of you guys want to shepherd your life? How many of you guys want God to be king and ruler of your life? Amen? And the reason you're here today isn't because you did or did not raise your hand, but in your hearts, I want you to pray with me. Let's pray. Father God, sometimes we read Psalms 23. Sometimes we read it on a poster or on a picture somewhere. Sometimes it was given to us. Sometimes people say it confidently because I memorized it, but Lord, right now we all stand shoulder to shoulder in the same exact spot because all of us have to ask you, Lord, please be my shepherd today. I'll ask you for the rest of my life, but every day I need to say, Lord, be my shepherd today. Take care of all my needs. Let me not wander and search after my wants, but let me trust you to take care of me. Let me be satisfied with the good things you've given me and not want anything more. Lord, when I get through the problems, when I feel things are closing in, when I feel I have no other option, when I feel I have no other choice, that you will remind me that you are with me. And it's not the end. And I don't have to make certain choices because you are with me. I don't have to do it alone, and I don't have to do it my way. But lastly, Lord, as we come to the end, we realize that, Lord, let us realize that you've blessed us so much. Our cup is overflowing and maybe we're wasting blessings. Maybe we're, we're uh, shunning your blessings. Maybe we didn't even ask, or, um, ask how to use these blessings, but we have so much around us. So Lord, today, we, Lord, we ask you to bless our cup so as you fill our life, it'll overflow and others will see that. And we'll say, Lord, how can we use these blessings for others? As we come to the end of our days, Lord, and you come again and return, you promise that you have a place in heaven for each person here. We don't know the way, but we know the person, that is Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and life. So Lord, today we say, Lord, be my shepherd. Shepherd me today and the rest of my life. Shepherd my children. Shepherd my relationships. Shepherd my decisions. Shepherd my children's, children's, children's relationships. Lord, help me now today. Precious Lord, lead me now.